Hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Jason Knight, and on each episode of this podcast, I speak to some of the best and brightest product and product-related thought leaders and practitioners I can find to help inspire all of us to make great products, great product teams, and great product companies. Now, tonight, we're talking all about communities, so if you want to be a part of mine, why not head over to onenightinproduct.com, where you can check out all of my other podcast episodes, sign up for the newsletter, join my Slack community. Or come to one of my virtual or live networking events to meet cool new people and make meaningful connections. So yes, community, community, community. On tonight's episode, we'll talk all about using a contrarian approach to growing B2B SaaS, not through sales-led hustle, but getting out there and building an audience, a community, a movement, and who knows, maybe even one day a religion. We talk about whether this is just for cool, exciting brands or if anyone can get in on the action, and all about the power of niching down to find those white spaces that really matter. For all this and much more, please join us on One Night in Product. So my guest tonight is Lloyd Lobo. Lloyd's a best-selling author, podcast host, entrepreneur, and community-led scale-up superstar whose life was turned upside down early as a kid by the Gulf War, which gave me his first insight into the power of community and people coming together. That was the start of a long journey from Kuwait through Canada to the US where he started and scaled a successful company, has now written a new book about his experiences and how we can all avoid making ourselves into commodities, something he's had first-hand experience of working in a call centre, just like me, but also, just like me, hates being a slave to the system and got straight back out again and made his own way in the world. He's here tonight to talk all about his new book, From Grassroots to Greatness, 13 Rules to Build Iconic Brands with Community-Led Growth. Hi Lloyd, how are you doing tonight? Jason, man, what a freaking intro. There's not a lot of hosts who can intro like that without reading, and that was phenomenal. And I often say, you bring out the energy you give out. So this is going to be action-packed. I'm stoked for this. There you go. Well, that's the thing. Like, If I can bring nothing else, I'll bring energy, and hopefully we'll get through it together. So first things first, we're going to talk all about your best-selling book in a minute, but I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about the man behind the book, i.e. you. So you're the co-founder, former president, and current board member at Boast, which you grew substantially through some of the techniques that you talk about in the book. But what does Boast do specifically? And I guess also, how much are you involved day-to-day these days? I am uh, not involved day-to-day at all, but uh, quite a very active board member at Boast and uh, two other companies, uh, one being a public one. And uh, it's funny that I get to show up looking like a rapper (laughs) to a public (laughs) company board meeting. Which is, you know, it's, it's uh, what's more important is substance <laughs> versus appearances. And, uh, you know, society has this definition of what good looks like. And I think everyone doesn't need to look the same, you know, uh, hair part in a certain way, khakis, uh, navy blue shirt, sling backpack, right? I think everyone has different perspectives. And, and the one thing I wanted to share is a diversity is the most indispensable enabler of growth. That's diversity of thought, diversity of execution, diversity of values, of course, good values. I think that diversity helps you grow faster. If you're the same, you're the same, you're the same, then it's it's very difficult to stand out. So boast globally, hundreds of billions of dollars are given in funding by governments to support innovation and R&D to small businesses, large businesses, anyone developing new tech or improving existing tech. Unfortunately, like anything, government and involves taxpayer dollars is just a cumbersome application process. It's prone to frustrating audits and receiving the money takes a long time. So with Boast, we set out to automate that process so companies could get more money faster for less time and risk. Over time, automating these applications And I can walk through the process of how we started the company with a veneer that there was tech, but actually we were doing it manually. (laughs) Then we used the revenue to build the tech and scale the company. We were bootstrapped. Man, at 10 million ARR, we were less than 30 people. We had no marketing team, right? And so that was a a big lift there is like stretching forwards, backwards, and sideways. And then over time, we said, you know what? The government takes still takes a long time to pay it out because even if you have your ducks in a row and you automate the application process, it still takes a long time. So then we started lending to those companies. We securitized these credits in a way and we started lending to these companies. So like other SaaS lending products like MRR financing, this is R&D financing. It's a new asset class. So you securitize your R&D and we lend against it. 
And now we have this very unique data set, which nobody does, right? Nobody collects your technical data from your R&D systems and your IP and your project management systems and stitches it with your financial data, which is your bookkeeping, your accounting, your banking. So now we have this unique data set. And so we can predict who you should hire, what projects you should invest in, how to drive dev velocity. So the next set of things are going to be around R&D analytics. And, and really, it didn't start this way in many senses, but I think, you know, great companies, some of the greatest lasting companies are built in great alignment. Alignment around your purpose, which is why do you show up every day? Your vision, which is what will the world be? Your mission, which is how you do it. And your values, which is how do you behave every single day? And for us, our purpose, like, you know, I was not from this industry. I don't know this better. But what drove me was enabling innovators to change the world. As cheesy as that may sound, but that's what made me wake up for 10 years. A lot of it being no pay, right? (laughs) Enabling innovators to change the world because every dollar spent in innovation returns 20 to the economy. Vaccines, robots, clean drinking water is a function of innovation. Yet, 90 plus percent of the innovations die on the vine. Why? One, because they don't have the resources, the funding, right, to advance them. And two, they don't have the know how. So, with the products around funding the R&D, we're solving that. And with the analytics products, we're solving the know how. Right. So, that's a really interesting story about how you got into it. And it also feels like maybe the type of problem you were trying to solve. Whilst I completely understand the need to solve it, and you know, I've obviously been involved in R&D tax stuff in the past in the UK before as well, but it also seems like the kind of thing that maybe a kind of typical VC firm, at least at the beginning, would be like, well, that doesn't sound very exciting, because it's kind of all kind of back office and technical, and there's the government involved and stuff like that. And I know you didn't take any kind of VC money, certainly to start with, you bootstrapped, as you say, but did you find... Or how did you find that it was the right time? Because I know you did eventually take funding. Like, When did you feel that it was the right time? What were the right signals? Or what were the signals that led you to believe that, well, okay, actually now it is actually time to take funding? You know, I have a great co-founder, Alex Popa, who comes from the R&D tax world. And uh, we're yin and yang. I am the front-ender. He is the back-end operations brains of the R&D tax and the business. And he was always anti-VC. Now, one, after university, my first job and my last job before becoming a founder were all working for startups. Number one, they all failed, right? They all, <laughs> so like it tells you they all failed. Alex is very much a calculated person, very smart, very sharp. And his thinking was always, if it can generate, if you can turn one into three or five, then it makes sense to take money. But let's not give up equity in your company and bring on other people into your marriage, right? If you can't do that. And if you look at it, man, the reality is how many companies at exit where the founders make tens of millions of dollars, right? Like I think the average equity by the time of exit after multiple VC rounds, the founders maybe each, if it's three founders, each founder maybe own eight to 10%. I'm an angel investor in a number of startups, which now I shouldn't have done. Because you're holding your money for a very long period of time, and the chances of them returning are low, maybe the venture capital funds will return. <laughs> and, and that's why, nonetheless, you're holding that money. It's not liquid for 10 years, right? Even if you invest in a fund. So if you want to return, better off investing in the S&P 500. At least, you know, year to date, it's high. And over a 10-year period, it does, it does 10. Don't angel invest unless you have liquid cash to gamble with And you're fine not seeing it for 10 years. And you're fine if it even goes to zero, right? So so anyway, we had all this knowledge between us. And the reality of the situation is not like anyone was coming, chasing and knocking on our door anyway, man. Like It's like everyone saying, oh, this is so manual. This is services. This is not scalable. Like, here's the thing. The only way to win big is to be contrarian and be right. Like have an opinion that's against everyone else. And then over a period of time, be right, right? And we even bet on a startup market. We were selling to startups. Nobody wanted to sell to startups in 2012, right? So it's like, oh, these guys will never pay you. Add like market risk, add technology risk, add like the government risk factor. But you know what happens today over time? All of those are moats, right? If it's a regulated industry 
and you have good revenue, it's not like people are jumping into that business to copycat it every day, right? If it's a startup market and you bet on that market in 2012, that market has absolutely exploded. And now you have a community of thousands of people. And we, we built a massive community called Traction to help those founders. So, you got those, so that becomes a moat. You got a community moat. You've got a technology moat. You've got an industry moat, which is like not everyone is, is jumping to do it. So all of those things become beneficial, but all of those things only work if you stick with it. If you listen to every naysayer and change course, you won't be where you are today. You need to have conviction on what you're doing and just never stop, right? If you think it's right. And what are the signals that'll tell you to never stop? Customers are paying you. Customers are staying with you. You're getting more customers. You're growing that cycle, right? What ultimately matters is customers are paying, they're staying, and you're adding more. So what a VC tells you is immaterial. At 10 million in revenue, Alex and I owned 100% of the company. We had less than 30 people. We didn't do a VC round. We did a growth equity round. We sold 52% of the company. And me and Alex came into wealth like we've never seen before, right? And Alex and I still own nearly 40% of a company that's over 20 million in ARR. That's not a bad deal. Now, if it goes to shit, of course, it's a bad deal. <laughs> but anything can go to shit over a period of time, right? But nonetheless, we got to catch a break and de-risk ourselves. Not many VC-backed companies can do that. So I think when the world is going one way, it's important to go the other way. And I, now, if I looking back, the advice I give people is don't build somebody else's definition of success. Certainly not some VC who's never started a company, never had to sacrifice payroll or like family life to do a company and who's playing sort of... And just a caveat, VCs are not bad people, right? I, a lot of my friends are. I'm an LP in 10 funds. But their MO is because they raise money from institutions and wealthy individuals, they need to show an outsized return. If you put your money in a VC fund and they didn't return, provide an outsized return after 10 years of locking it in, you're going to lose it. You're like, I should just put it in the S&P 500. So they're doing their job. Your job is to do your job. What is that? Figure out what your personal definition of success Trust me, it's never money. Like in my 40s, I know this now. I wish I knew it in my 20s. It's never money. It's what money buys you, right? And those are not things. That's not the BMW. That's not the mansion. It's none of that. It's time, right? So if you have kids, what is what gives you more time? Having a nanny 24-7 and not having to worry about how to make nanny payments. It'll change your life. Living close by where you don't have to commute, even if it's smaller, just being able to walk everywhere not only improves your health, but saves you time on the commute. Having somebody make your meals or drive you around, right? That brings you more time in your day. So optimize for those things. I know now in my 40s, and that's exactly how I live right now. But it, it took a few key lessons and almost dying to, to come to that realization. So nonetheless, the advice is figure out your personal definition of success which is not money, not things, but what level of freedom will money buy you. And that could be freedom to do what you want, where you want, with whom you want, when you want. It could be starting another company or living in Bali for all I care. Then how much money do you, need, do you need in your bank account to do that forever? Is there a version of the company you don't want to work for? And it could be like, oh, there's big company execs or like this company is moving in a direction where it's not aligned with my values. So you can say no. A lot of what we do is start from negotiables in life, right? Have your non-negotiables. And, and how long do you want to keep grinding, right? I think if you have answers to those four questions, it gives you the answers. For us, it's like looking back, everything is a framework, man, because you achieved some success, right? Whatever it is, moderate. But when you're in it, you're throwing spaghetti on the wall and hoping it sticks. We didn't take money because nobody was chasing us. If like 100 VCs were chasing us, I don't know if we would have taken, right? We went after the startup market because we tried our best to chase manufacturing and construction and oil and gas. And they wouldn't talk to us because we look like two young guys who threw a hoodie on top of a suit jacket. And they, <laughs> right, like they are the cigars club. So we just couldn't resonate. So we were forced to go and find our tribe, which were startups who were also starting like us and had the same problems. And so we could resonate. Today, it all looks like a framework. And I walk through I can walk through like how to pick your market and when to raise money and all of this. Back then, we're just like throwing spaghetti on the wall. Well, it all made a nice pattern at least, but you scaled the company through community-led growth and obviously that's what you talk about in your book as well. 
So just for the record, I mean, we can talk a bit about the specifics of what that means, but like on a high level, how are you defining community-led growth specifically in your context? And, and why was it such an amazing enabler for your business? Yeah, I think it was a it was a good springboard, and over time we you know we we dual track community with sales, and I'll walk through that exactly. But I want to preface it with a framework. All of my frameworks are in four steps, right? So in researching for this book, I found something very interesting. Every obscure idea that eventually became an enduring global phenomena, from Christ to CrossFit, went through the exact same four stages, and that's a that's a pretty big statement. And I'm not talking about the tech companies that formed in the 2000s and are up and down. But like every obscure idea from Christ to CrossFit that eventually became an enduring global phenomenon went through the same four stages. People listen to you or buy your product. You have an audience. Great. One-way communication. Maybe they're commenting here and there, but it's like a one-way communication. When that audience comes together on a cadence to interact with one another, it's a community. When the community creates impact towards a purpose that's beyond your product or profit, it becomes a movement. Harley Davidson, great example. And when that movement has undying faith in its purpose through sustained rituals over time, it becomes a cult or a religion. Audience, community, movement, religion. Of course, we didn't build a cult. We didn't build a movement. But we're 10 years in business. We built a community. And the reason and and how we built the community was we're having a very hard time cold calling and getting customers. And the thing is, despite I'm an engineer, my first job outside of university was cold calling because I asked a founder, what's the best skill I could acquire if I wanted to be a business person? And they said, it's selling. So I said, you know what? I can go... It's selling. It's communication, right? It's everything like from convincing your spouse to convincing customers (laughs) to convincing employees. So I said to myself, I'm not very self-motivated. If I went and tried to take a public speaking class and five people laughed me off stage, I would never do this again. But I can put myself in an environment that forces me to communicate day in, day out. So I took a sales job. Now, engineer graduating in 2005, who would give me a sales job? Nobody. Fortunately, there was a startup founder who needed cold callers and he's like, whatever, man, I don't care about your background. Just slam the phone. right? And so that environment of slamming the phones day in, day out, gave me the practice to eventually then work myself up to sales and then product and then running sales and running product and and GTM. Uh, Best skill set ever because what do you do as a founder? Talk to customers, figure out what to build, relay that to (laughs) the engineering team. So the best experience ever kind of thing. right? So nonetheless, I think when I started, when we started Boast, my first instinct was pick up the phone and call, dial for dollars. Nobody would take the phones, man. So then what do you do, right? So I, we started storming events from this oil and gas, construction, manufacturing, and nobody would really talk to us. It's like, just couldn't resonate. Dejected, we started going to the startup events. And man, it's like we found our tribe. They were starting companies. We were starting companies. We started to hang out together, party together, participate in hackathons together. It, be, it genuinely became our tribe. And now looking back, it's a framework as I think, right? You want to target a market. You want to start a company. The first thing, the first, first thing when you start a company, you got to figure out, start a company, become a content creator, whatever it is. You got to figure out who your ideal customer profile is, who you're speaking to, who you're selling to. How do you figure that out? My first criteria is, do you have a passion for this audience? Do you love creating for this audience? If you hate your audience, you won't be able to sustain. If I went after oil and gas, I don't think I'd write a book for startups, right? <laughs> like we, you know, 12 years uh, and going, 14, uh, yeah, 12 years and going, build a company for it, build a couple other products for it, build a community called Traction and Conference where I wrote a book for that same audience. So you need to have the passion for that audience because building a startup, a company, anything great is a long slog, man. So you got to keep showing up. The second thing is it is a small but growing market. I think it's almost important more important to niche down than niche up when you're starting up, right? And so we didn't go after all business. We didn't go after tech. We didn't go after all tech business. We went after startups. It was a small nascent market and we bet that it'll grow. When you niche down, 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 you find white space. The white space we found was no one was covering startups in that community. And all the events for startups were very high level CEO platitudes. Nobody had seen enough success that they could talk about how I got from A to B to C. And so we're like, uh huh, like, you know, 
if I'm starting a company, there's only so much Elon Musk inspiration I'm going to listen to. <laughs> I want to know how I get my first 10 customers. How do I do SEO? All of this. So we found that white space. The third is, can they pay you? And because we were a contingency-based offering, we knew if we got the money, we'd get paid. And the fourth one is ease of access. I don't care how much you love the market and you can build a big business around it. If you don't have ease of access, you'll never get off the ground. So passion for the market, small but growing, propensity to pay, ease of access. And so what we chanced into was, listen, let's just build a community for this. We started inviting speakers who would talk tactically about a specific topic to our co-working space and just cold reach out to startup founders and, and friends of ours who are startup founders to come. And they'd get tactical advice. Initially, 10 people would show maybe 15, 20. But the key is we never stop, man. We do this every week, week in, week out. One day, 200 people came to the co-working space. And the co-working space guys are like, listen, you can't run this anymore as a conference now. And you're like hacking a conference together, hijacking the aisles. And that eventually evolved into what we call the Traction Conference, where we had like CEOs of Twilio and Atlassian and Uber come. In parallel, what we did was I knew that I need to build an audience. Right? You, can't just, you, you have to build an audience to eventually turn that into a community kind of thing. And I knew that if we blogged, we'd get no traction. LinkedIn wasn't huge for content distribution. There was no Insta or... TikTok as a method of B2B content distribution. It was blogs, right? Famous bloggers like Neil Patel and Jason Fried. And I'm like, there's no way I'm going to compete with them. So I reached out to a local newspaper and asked them to give me a column talking about startups. And they said, no, obviously. I didn't take that no for an answer. I blogged on a third-party site, third, third-party regional startup blog. And I, this is what most people don't do. I reached out to all my friends in my phone book, in my WhatsApp, in my email list and asked them to like retweet it. And it got so many shares that I went back to the editor because I wanted to be in the newspaper for social proof. And I'm like, see this regional blog that I wrote, how much traffic it got. The newspaper is a dying medium for the younger demographic. If you cover startups, they will be hooked to your, to your channel. And he's like, fine, I'll give you one blog. And this is another learning. Never ask for permission, beg for forgiveness. I call that blog post startup of the week. And... Again, I shared it. I covered a startup founder who raised $3 million and wasn't getting any tech crunch or anything. So he blew it up, reached out to my whole phone book. They blew it up. And it got so much traffic that within hours or a day or so max, like the editor called me and I'm freaking out now. Like, ah, oh, he's going to get pissed why I called it Startup of the Week. But he said, man, this was so good. If you commit to writing it every week, I'll turn it into a print column. All of a sudden, two unknown guys got the credibility of the largest newspaper. We got a weekly startup of the week column with a backlink to our website, number one. So from, from the highest domain authority, what are the highest domain authorities uh, websites in the country? It's the government and it's the newspaper. And then it's the, it's the university sites. So I got that backlink. I mean, I, I learned all this on the fly. I'm like, oh man, our SEO is jumping. Instant credibility. So when we call people, because think about it, we're selling like a government a funding service that we're automating, we're collecting people's intellectual property. So credibility is really important. Having your name in the newspaper gives you credibility, right? Every week. And then what's really interesting is we put a form there saying, if you want to be featured, apply. So all those people started applying. So we started collecting their email addresses. Now it's today, you may be an influencer on LinkedIn, but you don't have anyone's email address. You got to do some hacks to collect it, right? Like keep promoting different products. So that was it. We, we started getting people's email addresses and whoever applied to be featured would invite us, them to our weekly meetups. And so that audience that was watching would then come together in person. And that was it, man. But when I look back, it was literally necessity is the mother of all inventions. I need to get clients. And the way to get clients is to be credible. Cold calling doesn't work. Who are the most credible sources I can align with publicly and be visible around? And I can sort of steal their or get their brand rub. That was it. But one thing that could happen in a situation like that, and obviously it all makes sense what you did and why you did it, but one of the things that could have happened is that you got lots of people that, you know, kind of thought that you were nice guys and very helpful and, you know, they kind of enjoyed consuming some of the content or getting in the paper and stuff like that, but didn't actually turn into customers at all. They just kind of sat there and effectively freeloaded off the back of it. Now, I'm sure you're always going to get a bit of that, but like, how do you recommend that people that try to go down that path start to 
turn some of those kind of fans into actual paying customers? Most people don't ask. They think their job is to do charity. Right? <laughs> uh, most people don't ask. And that helped like being salespeople. We ask like, hey, man, how are you consuming the service? And they'll be like, oh, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm like, great. Could, you, could we tell you more? Or I'm working with somebody else, like a big four. I'm like, hey, could we pitch you our service? And they're like, why not? Right? And some people don't convert for whatever reason. But you got to ask, man. You think like if somebody's at your event, like if somebody is at your house eating your steak and drinking your wine, we weren't serving steak and wine, by the way. We're serving, <laughs> we're, we were serving pizza. But let's say somebody keeps coming to your house and then you want to um, ask them for a favor. Of course, they're going to oblige. They'll at least listen to you, right? You just need to increase the number of people listening to you and they'll convert. It's a numbers game, right? You have the right message for the right audience. You've provided free value and they'll listen to you. But you also say that if you build a community, you won't become a commodity, which is kind of one of the taglines for the book, which we'll talk about as well. And that's very catchy and I get where it's going and it makes a lot of sense based on what you've already talked about. But also at the same time, it feels like every time I go anywhere these days, there's like another community and another person trying to set up a community, another company trying to set up a community be it just a blog thing or you know, Slack if groups or all these other things. Like- if you don't have the DNA of giving without expecting anything in return, it's not going to be long live, right? Because, because you got to show up and it takes a very long time to kind of pay back. Like I think everyone's jumping on this bandwagon right now and it's great. But the thing is, what is your unique value you're providing? I think, I think it's, a, it's a key thing. Like, you got every, like the, the world doesn't need the 100 sales group or the hundred, you know, Facebook group, what is the unique value you're providing? And um, better off having a small community of a hundred people that are high rollers than a million people that don't even want to spend a buck. Yeah, I guess where I was going, that was more like as a consumer, like as maybe, for example, one of your potential customers, or anyone that's trying to create a community's customers. It's almost analogous to me to like, Every time I park in a different parking lot, I have to download a different app, you know, sign up to a new thing to, to just to have the pleasure of working with that parking lot. And it kind of feels somewhat the same with some community work these days. Like every single place I go, I'm being invited to a new Slack channel, to a new this, to a new that. And it almost then starts to make communities themselves a little bit commoditized as well. Do you think there's a danger that if everyone takes your advice, that there'll be so many communities out there that it's actually hard for people to work out which ones actually deliver value? Yeah, you know what? I think the like with products, right? There's 10 products for everything. And there's like, I view community <laughs> as a product, right? Like, I think the consumers ultimately decide what they want to consume and what gives them the value. Yes, there's going to be more communities than ever because it's the flavor of the month. Like there were more blockchain companies and Bitcoin companies. And now there are more AI companies. You can't stop that because anytime something has the spotlight on it, everyone jumps for it. But ultimately, the consumers see through that and they pick the ones where, one, the purpose of a community is to make genuine connections for people and do it over a cadence around a specific cause or a purpose. And again, it ties to giving value first. If people keep giving value, they'll keep getting value. They'll keep showing up. And for me, honestly, I'm not on any Slack group. I just killed my Slack and I killed my Facebook, right? For me, I'd rather be on a small WhatsApp group with like 20 people I know and meet the same 20 people over and over again, right? And maybe there's some magic there, but I truly believe when the world goes buffet, you got to go Michelin star, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, and, and, and having that small group of friends, it's like, who are the people that you can share your, you know, I guess, brain space with over a consistent period of time? Like, you know, there's purposes of community, but like, it, to me, it's a com, it's, it's the, the key purpose is bringing people together to interact with one another, right? Around a specific purpose. And if that is served through podcasts and content, so be it. Make sure your content is the best. It's the most unique and, uh, it's differentiated where people don't get that value elsewhere. And if that is through in-person events, make sure the connections they make are relevant to them. So I think, I think this is where niching down becomes really, really, really important and everyone wants to go very broad. And so it's like, if you, for example, want to build a community of salespeople, 
then you got to see like, hey, what is my immediate addressable market? I'm in Vancouver, Canada. Why don't I build a community for people in sales in Vancouver doing SaaS sales? So you've niched down completely because they have a unique set of challenges that are very different than somebody in Silicon Valley. And then you can provide differentiated value and access, which they likely don't get elsewhere. Right? So I think that niching down is really important. If you can't provide 10x value with your product or your community or your service, then it's going to be it's going to be very hard. Or even like 3x the value, right? And that value with community is different. It could be the content itself. It could be the connections they make there and the interactions. And to me, that is more most important. Because we're in a content overload situation, right? There's content everywhere. If I Google search, I can find it. There's umpteen podcasts. The thing is the same guests are on like 100 podcasts or like me, right? Oh, yes. So then how do you differentiate is I think through genuine connections. If you're invited to a community where you meet 10 people that can add significant value to your life or even two people that can add significant value to your life without you freaking flying across halfway across the world, You'll go there repeatedly, right? If you learn something new, if you meet somebody new, it's like your tribe, right? Like, why do you, like, where do you hang out on the frequent? Let me ask you that. Where do I hang out? In person, like personally. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm old. I've got kids. I stay at home. But yeah, no, when I do go out, I generally go out with either small groups of friends or I run my own in person product management meetups in London. I run my product management virtual networking calls every week. I want a Slack community for product managers. But I think one thing that actually really resonates with some of the stuff that I'm trying to do at the moment that you kind of mentioned as well is I did a lot of thinking about sort of wide scale content and, you know, like things with podcasts and stuff like that. But I've got by far the most meaning out of a lot of the stuff that you've said, like setting up small groups, meeting small groups, of people having, as you say, WhatsApp groups with small sets of people and being there for each other rather than this kind of fast food engagement that you get with the larger stuff. So definitely resonates a lot with what you said uh, as well. Like it, it makes a lot of sense to me. So the, try to replicate the feeling that people get, that you get when you meet the same people every time and try to replicate it. And it starts small. Like you got to see anytime something gets saturated, whether it's community or AI, you got to offer a differentiated product or service, right? And maybe it's like, man, the same 100, 200 people like meeting each other because they just find something in common with each other. Find those people and give them an avenue to hang out. Maybe it's that the people in your geo do not want to travel halfway across the world to meet like-minded people. They don't want to go to San Francisco. They're, that's okay. Be the biggest game in town for them, right? So there's different ways to niche down. Or, you know, it could be like all the advice is at a certain level that's is a platitude like i it's not immediately applicable to me then figure out what level they're at and bring them the connections and the advice that's one level up or maybe two levels up so it's immediately applicable to them i think in a world where communities are getting saturated the only way to make it relevant is to niche down not niche up no absolutely well speaking of things being relevant and I guess to some extent actionable, you've got the book yourself that you've put out, which is based on a lot of the experiences and covers a lot of the themes that you've just been talking about. And we obviously want people to go and pick that book up, so we don't need to go into the whole thing. But I guess at a super high level, aside from just telling people how to do communities, like what is the core value proposition of that book? Like Why should people pick it up and what would they expect to find inside? Definitely. I mean, the book is a lot of frameworks around how to build and scale an audience and grow it to a community and turn it into a movement and a cult and religion. It's frameworks, not just from me, but like I've talked to a thousand plus people and looked at the guts of some of the most successful companies, like from Harley Davidson uh, to HubSpot. And it just gives you, it's like stories, basically. I used to hate reading, so it's a book that I can consume. <laughs> And it's stories and it gives you some thought provoking insight on where to start, how to define your ICP how to figure out your ICP circle of influence, how to figure out what event you should do or what community activity you should do, those kinds of things, a lot of framework, how to measure. One of the hardest things with community is the, the attribution of it because there's offline, there's online component, and it's truly multi-touch, right? You do a webinar. Now, a buyer may forward that webinar 
to somebody else in the company. That somebody else listens to the webinar, looks at it and goes to the website. That, that person may download a white paper and bookmark it and like maybe three weeks later, go back to that white paper and be like, oh, this is so relevant. Or like, you know, subscribe to your Instagram and see a clip. And then they might click the website link from your Instagram and request a demo. So now what? The demo request is attributed to <laughs> Instagram or inbound, right? And you lose that attribution. So I think one of the key things uh, that's difficult is attribution. So I talk a little bit about how to attribute it. But ultimately, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of what happened with Harley Davidson, right? See, I always say yesterday's innovation will always become tomorrow's commodity. We don't say dot-com company anymore. We don't say social company or mobile company anymore. And we won't say AI company anymore. And in fact, you know, if you look at OpenAI, which is the biggest success in AI right now, and in general, it was built on a community. Boast had access to OpenAI's community, I think, in like 2020. And we were playing with it and they were getting our feedback. And from tens of thousands of companies. Without community, they wouldn't be open AI, number one. Number two, look at what happened with Sam Altman. They tried to oust them and the community revolted, right? And so that is the power of community. And so, uh, but you need that and you need to keep showing up for your community so that when you need them, they will show up for you. And so I always say yesterday's innovation is tomorrow's commodity. But why look at the tech businesses? Look at the 80s. What was the innovation then? It was electronics. And the Japanese manufacturers commoditized electronics and started launching these bikes and Harley almost went bankrupt. The management said, we're going to make community a company strategy, not a marketing strategy. And this is what a lot of people do is they tuck community as a marketing thing. Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky calls himself CEO and chief community officer. There's a reason for that. It's a company strategy. Nick Mehta from Gainsight, billion dollar company. He, when they had no product, he was shouting from the rooftops about community. Dharma Shah, right? HubSpot. So it's like genuinely helping people beyond their product or service. And so with Harley, they went out there and started creating these writer clubs. Employees became writers. Writers became employees around the shared camaraderie and the joy and brotherhood of writing. And then they came together and started creating a movement that donating money to autism and cancer and rallies. And today, Harley is an iconic brand, right? Like if a dog wears a Harley Davidson jacket, like a leather jacket, you're like, oh, that's a Harley dog. (laughs) <laughs> when I go to conferences, I actually wear a leather jacket. You'll see in my video, I wear a leather jacket in my, in my headshots. And I wear knee-high boots and I show up and everyone's like, man, where's your Harley? And I'm like, see, you remember why, right? Because they've been building this community over a very sustained long period of time where it's become iconic. And so I think the key here is niching down and being relevant to a very specific group of people. So you look, feel, and seem like them, right? And so they want to hang out with you and you're not too broad. And then that growing that set of people over time. But do you think, because like I get it with Harley, for example, obviously iconic brand, but also it's kind of got a certain look and feel about it and a certain kind of built-in fan base of the types of people that like to ride Harley bikes. Like I, I get that. I've never ridden a bike, but like I get the, you know, we've all been there in our in our own groups as, you know, there's me as a goth back in the you know, 90s and stuff like that. Like We've all been there, right? But are there some companies out there that might be, or people from those companies maybe listening to this thinking, yeah, but that's not going to work for my industry because my industry is too boring or something along those lines? Or do you think that this type of community-led growth initiative can pretty much work in literally any industry? I think it can work in any industry in parallel to whatever you're doing. I'm not saying stop what you're doing. If you're a sales-led organization, do sales, right? We had, we didn't just have community and left it to the whims and fancies of doing charitable work. We (laughs) actually had me selling. And then the next salesperson and next salesperson that we brought on, they were salespeople with a community lean, meaning they went out there and then just say, buy my product, buy my product. Like, how can I help you? What else do you need? Oh, maybe I have a connection for that. They were community-led salespeople, right? And that's, that's how the organization grew. I'm just saying, if you want to give, you want to bring people towards a purpose that's beyond your profit, your employees will be more aligned. Right? I, I talk about this framework called CAMPER, Connection, Autonomy, Mastery, Purpose, Energy, and Recognition. In 2024, record number of layoffs in the last couple of years. But 
anyone can do consulting and drive an Uber or go on Upwork. Like the solopreneur jobs have gone through the roof, right? Content creator. If you have the will, you have the way because technology is at its height here. So how do you keep people to stay at your nine to five when people are saying, you know what, I'll move to Bali maybe and I'll do like consulting on Upwork and I'll make my money. Like there has to be a greater purpose they align with. I truly believe that. That gets them to show up. And so I think when you bring that into your company and you get people to rally around a purpose through community, you'll get them coming back for more, both customers and your employees. And a lot of people phrase this as a corporate social responsibility and all these BS buzzwords. But literally what it is, is, man, how do I do good beyond my profit? Right. And that actually, <laughs> I'll say this is a very funny thing. Selflessness is the best selfish long-term strategy, <laughs> right? If you help people get what they want beyond your profit, you'll eventually get what you want. Word of mouth spreads. And I've seen this. I've seen this in, in many cases. My, my grandparents grew up in the slums of Mumbai and they had uh, 10 kids. And literally, there's, they got to go to a tap every morning to fill water. There was no washroom in the house. And I saw that as a kid every summer when I'd go visit them. And there's be some random person staying there because Mumbai is like the New York of India. And I asked them, I'm like, hey, why do you have this random person staying here? And, uh, you know, whatever I'm saying sounds as whims and fancies now, right? It sounds like foo-foo pixie dust, but I truly <laughs> believe in it. And I'd ask them that and they'd be like, you know, if you help people without expecting anything in return, you'll get everything in life. Karma will come back to you in ways you can't even imagine. And I never made sense. But I truly attribute a lot of how I'm living today, the, the benefits I have is from the karma that was generated because after my grandparents, none of his kids lived in the slums. After, when, they, when they came of age, they're, they're in the UK, they're in Australia, US, Canada, their, kid, their, their grandkids are well off. There are lots of people who are still in the slums. You got 10 kids to break out of the slums and be well off and self-sustaining, including their kids. To me, that in itself is a miracle. I don't even know how that happened, right? There are a lot of people who are still in the slums. Lots of people I know that are still there that, you know, my grandparents, uh, comrades, right? And so, like, to me, I, I truly believe in that philosophy. And it's very hard to explain, but it served me well. This community is the reason why we were able to sell the company to a growth equity firm. Honestly, in the middle of a pandemic, we hosted an event. When there was the first opening, this firm came to the event. They're like, who hosts it? And, and asked me to join the Venture Partner Network. And I'm like, listen, I have a business to run. This community is supporting that. And they're like, tell me about your business. And they were like, what? Can we invest? And I'm like, listen, we're not interested in taking investment. I was just like starting to you know, <laughs> promote or support our lifestyle. Didn't want to deal with investors. And they're like, no, no, no. We're not traditional VCs. We're growth equity. I didn't even know what growth equity was. <laughs> yeah, like they explain, like, hey, we buy a company and cash you guys out so you can de risk in the short term and keep some equity in so you can play the long game. And I'm like, man, if that community event didn't happen and we didn't keep showing up, that transaction would have not happened. Right. And so, like, I live in Dubai now, right? I split my time between Dubai and San Francisco. Almost everyone I know in the community here is a connection from my community. And I know some really, really influential people here. My kids gone into school that was waitlisted within days. I got my visa uh, my residency here within like five, six days. So a lot of that I feel is like engineered community. Like they say your network is your net worth. And I don't like that as transaction. I think your community is your currency uh, is, is better. And it's, it's hard to explain, but everyone in some way or the other has probably experienced it is that, like, you know, if I, if I didn't hang out and work for, Four, three entrepreneurs before, I don't think I would have been an entrepreneur. It would be a very hard leap, right? You, be, you become the average of the people you surround yourself with. Your community truly, truly becomes your, uh, your currency. And that, this is the pixie dust part is like, I don't, have, I, have the, I don't have the data to prove the sort of like, you know, like a VC metrics week on week. Oh, how many connections did I make? And what did we do? I don't have that. But I have the outcomes. I'm like, hey, how did you come here? You came to an event. How do I we, how do I win this big client? It came to this event. How did how did this this big? Uh, there's a big partner uh, that white labels us in the U.S. that spends like three million dollars a year with us. Directly came out of the community event. 
So th- those are things I think ultimately what it does for you is it gives you brand recognition and credibility by association. And because you're associating with a group of people who speak highly of you and they're all influential. So you get their superpowers. Yeah, I like the term kind of engineered serendipity. Like you kind of put yourself out there, you make these connections, you do all of the things, and then you're kind of making your own luck in a way. It's like, and obviously luck in itself is to some a troublesome term, but like just this idea that if you, I can't remember who did the quote, but like, yeah, the more I try, the luckier I get or something along those lines. It's like, if you keep putting yourself out there, you keep showing up, then you're automatically making it more likely that things are going to happen. Good things are going to happen for you in the future. So definitely resonates with me there. Well, we could talk for hours about all of this stuff. I know, but very conscious of your time, want to make sure that you uh, get to do all of the things you need to do today. So where can people find you after this? They want to find out more about the book, join your communities, dig into community-led growth in general, or try and get some top tips on how to escape the call center. Yeah, de- definitely. So for me, I'm taking a LinkedIn sabbatical. I wanted to go off all things business. I'm more on Instagram now, like I share about like fitness transformation, life after 40, some business stuff, um, inspiration there, but a, a lot more about fitness. And I think the reason being, it's very hard to be fit after 40. Life happens. Oh, you don't have to tell me, geez. <laughs> best, the best intentions. And so I talk a lot about that now. I've been recently posting on Instagram, Lloyd, double L-O-Y-E-D, Lobo. And every day is like some post about like a fitness transformation combined with like some business advice clips from the podcast I've been on. Um, so that's where you'll find me on Instagram, double L-O-Y-E-D, L-O-B-O. LinkedIn, you'll find some some really informative old posts. And then just go to Spotify and subscribe to Traction Conf or go to tractionconf.io and uh, you can subscribe to the newsletter there. But yeah, I'm, I'm like on sabbatical mode after building community, building business. I had neglected my kids for a very long time and my family. And so now this last couple of years has been all about that. And it just didn't happen. It wasn't happenstance. After we cashed out, I got COVID and almost died. And my wife was a physician at Stanford and she couldn't see me in the same hospital. It was like people coming in spacesuits and 24-hour Zoom. And over the course of time, I realized like, what good is the chase? Like Most of us keep chasing and they have a moving target. I hit this number and then that target moves and moves and moves. You know what you don't chase is your health and your family. Money, power, fame, everything is fleeting. What remains is your health and your family. So prioritize it. And, and so I'm just paying back the family and health. Uh, here, here. And something that we should all try and do. And again, don't have to tell me how hard it is to stay fit in your 40s. I'll make sure to link everything into the show notes anyway. Hopefully you get a few new Instagram followers, people listening to the podcast and, you know, building a, a slightly different sort of community. Maybe do some push-ups at the same time as well. Well, awesome. that's been a fantastic chat. So obviously really super grateful. You could take some time out of sabbatical to talk about all things community related and a little bit about the book. Obviously wish you all the best, but as for now, thanks for taking the time. Sounds good, man. This was great. I enjoyed the conversation, enjoyed the energy, wishing you a healthy, productive and prosperous 2024. As always, thanks for listening. I hope you found the episode inspiring and insightful. If you did, again, I can only encourage you to pop over to onenightinproduct.com, check out some of my other fantastic guests, sign up to the mailing list or subscribe on your favorite podcast app and make sure you share with your friends so you and they can never miss another episode again. I'll be back soon with another inspiring guest, but as for now, thanks and good night.